Welcome to the Good Life EDU podcast presented by the Nebraska ESU Coordinating Council. I'm your host, Andrew Easton. Thanks for joining us as we discuss the latest in digital learning across Nebraska and around the country. All right, I'd like to welcome everybody back for another episode of the Good Life EDU podcast. And today I'm getting a chance to catch up with the Dr. Jim Rickabaugh. I would say the godfather of personalized learning and someone who I have not had a chance to really visit with for a couple of years now. And I always really appreciate the opportunity when I get the chance to sit down and uh, talk shop with Jim about personalized learning and learner-centered experiences. And so Jim, great to see you. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Andrew, it's great to it's great to see you. And you're right, it's been way too long. And a lot has happened, by the way, in the last couple of years. So we have a lot to talk about. <laughs> we do. And I have uh, really circled this date on my calendar as uh, one that I've been looking forward to. You're just such a tremendous educator and someone who has taught me so much. And so I'm really grateful to continue to learn from you today. Uh, For those of you that don't know Jim, he is the former director and senior advisor at the Institute for Personalized Learning. That's actually a division of CISA One, which is a service agency. So we got cross state lines here with our service agencies nationally, getting a chance to collaborate with Jim. And so thanks for joining us. Jim, give us a little bit of your backstory with personalized learning. Uh, Thanks, Andrew. And I'm honored by your introduction because I have a great respect for you, and you are, in fact, a tremendous educator. So I take that very, uh, very honorably. Thank you. Appreciate uh, it. Well, my backstory with personalized learning, it goes back actually a, a long way. Almost my entire career was in education. I left for a while to go into business, but actually it was interesting. My departure from education actually brought me back more convinced of learner-centered or personalized learning than before I left. The work I was doing was for a, actually a startup company that was providing after school and summer learning experiences, intensive, immersive, hands-on learning. And what struck me was how I would visit schools, see students during the day who seemed lethargic, barely engaged. And then I would encounter them later after school involved in these, and by the way, they were through a partnership with the Smithsonian with John Hopkins. So there were very rich experiences. And here were these kids doing experiments with, uh, and NASA was one of the uh, partners, doing experiments with flying airplanes and what are the physics involved with that? These kids are amazing. They were studying the body and they were like completely engaged. I'm thinking to myself, there's something wrong here. This isn't right because this same content presented in the sort of straitjacket of a traditional curriculum wasn't inspiring them. But when students had opportunities to choose, when they saw a purpose in the work that they were doing, when they saw an opportunity to be successful, it was like all of a sudden a light switch goes on. And so for me, that was, and, and by the way, that was a long time ago. This is almost maybe 30 years ago. But so I went back in the superintendency and this whole thing continued to germinate. There's a saying that says, ahas are not really a, an aha moment. Ahas are a part of a journey. What happens is over time, you have a sense about something, but you don't necessarily have the full picture. And that ahas are actually things you already have colliding, coming together, and that you suddenly see something you didn't see before. And that's really kind of what happened with me uh, back in 2009, 2010, when a group of us were just sort of so frustrated with what was going on you know, specifically students and teachers are working so hard, but so many students aren't engaged. So many are not being successful. In those days, every year there were increases in funds for schools, but we still never had enough. And it was like, okay, there's something wrong here. It's time for us to start thinking a little differently about what's going on. What might that be? And so what happened was we spent like a year trying to study this. And when it was over, we came back to the really obvious conclusion that real learning is personal and has always been personal. And that the problem is we have a system that treats it as though as a standardized, predictable linear process when we all know that it's not. And so that really sort of launched our backing up and saying, well, okay, what might learning look like if we designed it around the learner and connected the learning to what learners already know, what has purpose for them, give them opportunities to see a path to mastery, what would that look like? And so that's really from there, the rest has continued to to grow and expand, but it's almost, to me, almost embarrassing to sort of think about how 
we get so caught up in the traditional system that we think that's actually how learning happens. And it's like learning happens in spite of it, not because of it. And so what if we just designed a system and maybe more important today than ever that has learners engaged in developing their capacity to learn in ways that are engaging for them, that's purposeful for them. So that's kind of the journey. I had so an opportunity in 2010 uh, to actually be the first director of the Institute for Personalized Learning. Then we just called it the Institute, by the way, because we didn't really know what to call this. <laughs> and then later we decided it was the Institute for Personalized Learning. And that's grown from just being a small regional initiative in southeastern Wisconsin to now I think it's in 16 states. So we continue to work within the regional service units within Wisconsin, but also spreading out into other areas. So that's the journey. Wow. And, and so much work done there over the course of that time to refine, to further develop and explore mm -hmm. really everything that goes into this topic. And, and that's kind of where I'd like to go next with this, too, is to just ask, when we talk about personalized learning, there, for many, come to mind some example that they've had, or they might latch on to the word personal and associate anything that is personal to the learner as falling under that moniker of personalized learning. And so uh, could you bring a little clarity around when we talk about personalized learning? And, and I heard a little bit of it in your explanation there, but how do you mm -hmm. define it and what are some of those key characteristics? Sure. So let me give you what for me maybe is the sort of the nutshell around it. And at the Institute, we call it our POWER acronym, P-O-W-E-R. So the first is purpose. We know that when learners have a sense of purpose, they learn more. But we all do. And not just in school, by the way, and anywhere in life. In fact, purpose is the most powerful driver of learning known to man. If we have a purpose, we almost always learn. So P for purpose. O is for ownership. And there's Many people think about personalized learning as teachers have to create all these plans and, and there has to be an individually for each student and understand exactly what they need, what they're going to do. What they miss is that the most often the richest resource sitting in the room is the learner, him or herself. And in, in the traditional system, that resource sits largely dormant most of the time. So the idea really is to give learners opportunities to own their learning. And you get there by giving them choice, giving them some voice, giving them opportunities to set goals for their learning, but to do that through the eyes of the learner, not through the eyes of the teacher or the curriculum, but sort of from the learner's perspective, what does that look like? So you have purpose, ownership, and then the W for wonder or curiosity. So again, I mean, in fact, there's a really interesting study, I think it was about 2018, uh, reported in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association about the power of curiosity for learning. And essentially, the study was set up to look at, particularly for younger children, what role does curiosity play? And, and they found in the study that if we can keep curiosity alive for students, particularly for students in minorities or poverty, uh, students that have traditionally struggled in school, that curiosity alone is enough to overcome many of the barriers that come through culture and poverty and other. But the problem is that in school, we don't necessarily nurture curiosity. We don't honor curiosity. In fact, in many ways in early grades, we try to diminish it because it's disruptive. Hmm. So you have this power sitting out there, curiosity that often goes ignored or, or more than ignored even, pushed down and, and, and try to extinguish so it doesn't get in the way of standardized lessons. So purpose, ownership, wonder, and then E, efficacy. Just this idea that if I give good effort and I use good strategies and I employ the resources around me, I can learn really difficult things. And then if I try something and the first time I, I don't get it, it doesn't mean I can't learn it. It just means I need a better strategy. I need to look at the effort or are there some resources that I need to bring to bear for that to happen? And then the last one, R, is responsibility. And often as educators, we think, oh, responsibility is, are you turning your papers in on time? When in fact, responsibility says, I will take responsibility. And what we find is that if students experience purpose and ownership and wonder and efficacy, they ask for responsibility. They want responsibility. And so that may be a little longer definition, but in terms of what really is this? 
I mean, I, those pieces, I think, capture both research and experience around what makes really powerful learning. I so love and appreciate that all those pieces and the thoughtful evolution of those resulting in what you said is that that transfer of responsibility, right? We always will talk about how there needs to be a certain degree of gradual release uh, when it comes to that. Uh, And I think that that's both from the educator's lens where we're so used to as the practitioner in the room driving everything that there has to be a little bit of a slow release so that we can give over those responsibilities and that students not have to take those on so quickly that it does overwhelm them or leave them feeling like they they aren't clear or have the ability uh, to run with that so in fact i think interesting in that uh, andrew is that in some ways this idea of of release of responsibility or students feeling overwhelmed is a school phenomenon in most of life kids don't worry about that they don't worry about getting over, over. If they're starting a video game, they don't worry about gradual release. It's like, get out of my way and let me go after it. Yes. Oh, so we've taught them that adults have to guide you. They have to do this work for you. And for some students, that's just fine. It works really well. There are other students who really would just like to get in there and mess with it. And then after they've tried some things, to have the opportunity to ask questions and be coached up. Those are all possibilities. But it's just interesting that we get caught sometimes because of our own experience in a traditional education and, and frankly, our training, that sometimes we take on responsibilities that if we just let students have would really ignite their curiosity, ignite their commitment to learning and their energy they would bring to the process. Yeah, that speaks to me so much. I was actually going to, as you mentioned that, I was like, yes, video games is a great example of that. I also know too, my son loves to get in the kitchen and and cook. And the Mm. more that you kind of let him do his own thing and maybe deviate from the recipe a little bit, he learns, you know, whether or not that helped or hurt what he was uh, tinkering with at the time. And you're right, kids, kids really love and appreciate the opportunity to do that. But the traditional experience where there's a singular right answer or an expectation uh, that's really narrow that you're trying to shoot for it that just doesn't make space for that well in fact uh, andrew i think you're right and the other is the path to get there so there are certain things where there is a single answer there is an answer Mm -hmm. but almost always there are multiple paths to get there the magic is often in the path giving kids opportunity and i see the example of your son the recipe is perfect because that deviation may improve or, or may make the recipe worse in either case, it's learning. And when he's finished, I mean, the idea is to have a food that's edible at the end. So that's, you know, there is a kind of a right answer there. Right. But the path to get there can be, can be multiple. And therein lies, I mean, I think often for people say, well, you know, we have standards to meet. Yes, we do. But the path to standards are often almost limitless. Well, and in there too, I can kind of parcel out, and and I heard this earlier as well, there are some misconceptions sometimes as it pertains to this work. And so could you kind of speak to, now that we've defined what personalized learning is, uh, what are maybe some of those things that we miss? Sure. Well, many of the misperceptions are actually quite longstanding. I mean, the early days of discussion around personalized learning was that it's a technology initiative. And there's actually a recent study out of the Atlantic Economist, sort of internationally looking at sort of what's the role of technology in personalized learning to so that piece. Interesting, their observation was technology doesn't change learning, but learning changes the use of technology or the choice of technology. That in the end, to be successful, it goes the other direction. But one of the misconceptions is that it's a technology initiative. And I think we've been in this long enough to know that technology is not that answer. Technology can support the work. Technology can offer opportunities for students, not just to be consumers or appliers of learning. They can be creators of learning. So there's a lot can happen there. Uh, But what's important is the learning piece. Uh, The second is that personalized learning is really teachers designing all these individual customized learning paths for every learner. And while, Sometimes you need to do that to get learners started. The goal isn't to be creating individualized learning plans for every student. It's for students to be actively engaged in constructing the path, the learning, setting goals. Because the world for which we're preparing today's learners is not one in which compliance drives it or where they're gonna be told what they should do. 
their world is one in which discovery and creativity and flexibility and innovation are at the core. And we need to give learners those kinds of opportunities. So for me, in fact, often I even move from personalized learning to learner-centered. Sometimes that's a little more comfortable for people. Because if we think about learner-centered here, we start to ask questions like, what does this learner know already? Because we know learning begins where the learner's learning already is. And what is this learner ready to learn? What do I know about this learner? What can this learner bring to the process so that as much as possible, the learner is a co-designer? Now, in some cases, learners may be sole designer, that they're on a quest, they've got a passion, and, and our role is to step back and coach. But most of the work happens in the interaction where we're coaching learners, we're developing understanding together with learners, but always with the goal of developing their capacity, not just their content. What we want to do is work ourselves out of a job, except it never happens because there's always more to do. Yeah. And what I've seen from teachers, when that lens isn't representative of what oh, you're stuff, sharing yeah. there and coming at yeah. it from the lens of the learner, is that the first step becomes differentiation, or I'm, I'm going to make different levels and different tiers, which is great practice. Okay, it's good to Nothing, do, right? It's not it's to good. take away from. I love differentiation, yeah. uh, but but if your aim is to personalize, then you get to a point where you say, and I did whenever I was uh, teaching the classroom, I had 151 students at one point in time. I am it. not able to right. differentiate for 151 different students, right. and and then yeah. I go, well, personalizer doesn't work, and then I walk away. Versus yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. Yeah. Well, and it's it, it's counterintuitive. But it's like, people say that's too much work. You say, really, actually, it's not more work, it's different work. Mm -hmm. It's engaging learners in the process of learning and bringing my expertise to the process, as opposed to preparing this, this high quality lesson that I present to learners. Instruction is really an iterative process. It's not stand in front of the class and share all your knowledge. In fact, if you just even think about that piece, the sort of model that the sort of John Locke theory that what educators are supposed to do is pour the knowledge from their head into the head of the learner. If that ever worked, it's long since gone. Think about the variety, the breadth, the sort of rich array of places that today's young people can get information that might be converted into knowledge. One way remains the teacher as a source, but the teacher is no longer a sole source provider. So now our role becomes curator. It becomes the sort of curiosity instigator. I mean, all these other kinds of things that help learners have access to this rich array because in the end, one, they'll become much more skilled learners and two, far better prepared for the future they're going to inherit. Absolutely. And you sit there and think about the things that you maybe do as the teacher to get ready for what might be that yep. one size fits all approach and then build out opportunities for students to be a part of what maybe was previously behind the scenes. Right. And, and pull, yeah, it's like pulling the curtain back and saying, come on in, come on in. Let's talk about what this is like. And now all of a sudden the learner goes, holy cow, this is a really different experience than I, than I thought this was. By the way, this is the learning I used to do outside of school. I didn't realize you could do that in school too. <laughs> right. And bring your interests with you and, uh, yeah. and tailor it. So that's, uh, and I love all that. And, and you mentioned a moment ago too, about how uh, that those days of that John Locke approach are long gone. Uh, Jim, it's been two years really since we've had a chance to sit down like yeah, this and sure. visit. Uh, I know that uh, the why that was there you know, 30 yeah. years ago or 15 years ago, and I guess, or in the last, you know, sure. two years ago is still there, but times yeah. have also changed drastically in the last two years. And so yeah. how would you say in that brief window, uh, has mm -hmm. this work become even more relevant? Yeah. In fact, it, interestingly, uh, even on a large scale, the growth around what people call personalized learning, and, I, and as we've just discussed, there are different definitions, uh, but there was a study published just maybe four or five months ago by the Atlantic Economist. And it was really just sort of this international look at what's happening with personalized learning. So here's what's, it's interesting. 99% of the people they interviewed, this was in the UK, the United States, and a, and a couple of other European countries. 99% say, 
personalized learning practices have grown in their school. And something like nine in 10 administrators believe that more of their budget will go towards personalized learning. But the question is, what exactly are you talking about? So what I would say out of the gate is just this idea that the concept that learning ought to be personalized, that it ought to be relevant for me, is nearly universally accepted. Well, a heavy majority. I, I, these days, I hate to say universal anything, but just but sure. the idea of having a learning experience that matches my needs and my readiness, people get. So it's sort of that sort of that piece has shifted. The pandemic, I think, if anything, really laid bare many of the inequities and sh and shortcomings of the traditional system. Now, the danger we face right now is that people are hungry for certainty and predictability. And the danger is, even though all those things were laid bare, that we still go back there because at least that's familiar and seems predictable. Uh, but one of the things we learned about technology in this process is that it can actually be an integral part of what's going on, not just an add-on. And we didn't have a choice. And you know, you think about the, just sort of the, the use of technology throughout the pandemic, was largely to try and do what we did in person, now to do it virtually, which for some people led them to a conclusion that, you know, this whole process, the whole e-learning piece, it doesn't have much potential when in fact it has tremendous potential, but what they experienced isn't anything compared to what it could do. And so, so that piece is rolling. Now there's, I think the next generation, maybe it's a generation or a half down the road, is when we really start to understand what virtual reality and artificial intelligence can do to help this work. Because many of the sort of back of the house tasks that educators have been doing can be done so that our engagement with learners can be real time. And there's some really interesting studies emerging now coming out of the pandemic in the business world around the use of immersive virtual reality to accelerate learning of skills. So there was a, a study I published gosh, maybe three, four months ago uh, by uh, PwC Labs around immersive virtual reality. So it's this combination of virtual reality, artificial intelligence to help adults learn skills relevant to their work. What they found was compared to the traditional classroom, that's what they did, set it up, classics experiment, that the pace of learning was four times what learning happens in a traditional classroom. They were able to expose people to the content in segments of 20 minutes that in the classroom took an hour. And retention was 75% higher. So now we're not talking about this marginal, it's a 5% increase. What I just described for you is transformational in the business world. Now, these are adult learners. That's true. Question is, would it work for younger learners? Well, learning is learning. There's more in common than difference. But that's going to be out there. The, the question of how might these really rapidly developing technologies help us transform learning that is truly learner-centered and that positions educators to be the conduit, the curator, and the designer of experiences that really can transform the experience of learners. So I think there's a lot happening and it's, it's exciting. Of course, in the business world, there's more resources. I mean, admittedly, there are more resources and the return on investment is clearer and faster. But the education market is huge and it's not gonna be that long before serious questions about how can we really integrate virtual reality in something that's not just uh, a journey to a place we've never been, but that's actually a fully integrated experience that's real-time learning. <laughs> Real-time learning as though it were happening in real life. So I, I'm, I'm excited about where things are going. It's a little uh, unsettling because it continues to push on the sort of assumptions that we've had about learning and schooling and what we do as a profession. Uh, but at the same time, I think it opens up these possibilities that go way beyond what any of us would have imagined even five years ago. 
as I think, and I have been thinking a lot about that virtual reality space and artificial intelligence, we in our ESU network statewide had a chance to have a small cohort of us go through the ISTE General Motors course last year and learned quite a bit. Did a podcast on that actually last spring uh, with Dr. Helen Crompton. So check that one out if you haven't uh, listened to it, those that are listening in. Uh, And I am absolutely fascinated by that thought. And I I think that if you're having trouble thinking about what, what do we even mean by VR, Uh, If you could imagine, instead of being on a flat Zoom screen, uh, being able to put on a headset and actually feel as if you are in a lab somewhere, Uh, if you're actually in, maybe it's even like an automotive garage uh, and you're going to shop class, getting the opportunity to to learn straight from a, you know, and, and it could be an expert who's in there in real time giving you the coaching, right. teaching, and the lesson uh, yes. that might not even be on the same continent that you're on. <laughs> right. Doesn't and, have to be. Right. Yeah. Right. And it is, uh, it is incredible to think about what that paired with artificial intelligence, where you could you really have things be driven so much by data. And, uh, and, and if you circle back to how does this pertain to personalized learning, uh, how do we empower learners to... Uh, I guess, and I'm asking this as a question, right? Uh, Like, how do we empower learners to be successful when those types of resources are available to them? Yeah. So one of the, I think, daunting challenges for educators is to let go of our sort of expertise and experience in a traditional system and, and begin to ask some different questions. And that is, what learning is in front of my learner? And what's the best way to design with the learner, in some cases for the learner, an experience that will result in that learning to happen. And there are myriad ways that can be. So the virtual reality piece becomes one of the tools. Artificial intelligence becomes another of the tools. By the way, our coaching is another of the tools, pairing them up with other learners. So for me, it's standing back and always asking the question, how might this happen? Not how did it happen, but how might it happen? Staying open to that at at each point, bringing our expertise about the learning process and how learning happens, bringing our insights and understanding about the learner and pairing that up with the experience that can have learning happen. And if virtual reality is in a position to provide that, then we have a responsibility to give kids that opportunity. But if it's just sitting down having an intense conversation with the learner where they're exploring some of the things that may be getting in their way, or they're exploring some things that they're curious about and figuring out a path forward, that's really valuable too. In fact, probably equally valuable. So this is not an argument at all that educators become irrelevant. They actually become in some ways more integral to the the learning process. And by the way, creates an opportunity for educators to continue learning too. I mean, we sort of let go of that myth that educators were to be experts in everything. I mean, that same group of skills that work for learners, the idea of purpose and ownership and wonder and efficacy and response, all fit for us as educators. It's part of the transformative process. And if we're willing to let go and take a little bit of risk, maybe take a deep breath, the opportunities that lie before us are amazing. And without that too, I don't know how we even start to, because it is a factor, not the only one, but how we start to address teacher shortages and yeah. the retention, uh, because yes. you're right, it is fulfilling as an educator to be able to have that type of professional experience and yes. lens for how you view the work that you do. So I mean, that raises a question, Andrew, and that is, what if we actually stepped back and started to think about the role of educator in that context. Now, what I just described, I don't know about for you, for me, that's a really attractive career. I mean, that's an amazing career. One that you probably can't replicate in many places. This idea of being in a front row seat for learning, watching that happen in real time, in ways that are exciting learners, that are opening horizons for them, who would want to do that work? The idea of being a learning experience designer has always been incredibly intriguing to me. And as you said, (laughs) we're going to have data and tools that are probably not even imaginable at this moment uh, that will certainly be integrated, I would imagine, within the next 10 years, 15 at most. That's probably the outside. I would say 10 is the outside. And, and, And we need to be cognizant. These are tough times. 
and they're bewildering times. In some cases, really frustrating, distracted times. My sort of piece on it is, I get that, we get that, we need to accept that, but that should not limit us for where we're headed. Where we are shouldn't dictate where we go. Absolutely. And speaking of actually where we are, because uh, I, I love, we could, we could continue to prognosticate. I love this. It is so fun. Um, and sure. Jim and I, we're going to follow up on that once we stop recording. But, but for the moment, all right, uh, one thing that I did want to touch upon uh, sure. is that there is a big push within Nebraska, and we're not the only place that this is happening, uh, with MTSS, all right, yes. so the multiple, yep. multiple tiers of yep. systems of support. support. Yep. Uh, and so, with that, I think there is a bit of a opportunity within uh, that tier one structure uh, to yep. integrate some of what we're talking about here today. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's more of a, a Venn diagram of sorts where there's certain places where those intersect and, and at the same time, yes. maybe not fully. Uh, can you maybe speak to that a little bit from your work to let us maybe understand where those two relate? Yeah, sure. And the exact systems are a little different state to state. So let me try and stay broad with this. Mm. Um, and so, you know, I think you're right. For students who, who need a nudge, who need some coaching, in many ways, this sort of a learning experience opens up a possibility that's within the realm of those kinds of options. You know, as we start thinking about those uh, more structured, more interventionist sorts of supports, we need to remain cognizant that our role is to develop capacity in learners, not just fill their heads with facts or check off a checklist of things we've done. So one of the ways to just sort of that for me that helps to think about it is that we talk about supports, supports are important, but there's, there can be danger in supports. So if you think about uh, when you construct a house, there are key supports that go into that house remaining in place. And so if you think about, you know, sort of building the structure, those are important, but when we say supports, they stay there, okay? And we can't afford to have students become so dependent on a service or on a piece of support that they don't grow. And so for me, it helps to think about the, those as scaffolding. So what we wanna do is provide enough support for learners to grow. And that those scaffolding pulls back as soon as learners are able to do it on their own. I mean, if you think about if you're building a fireplace, you're going to, you, you put scaffolding up there, you hold until the concrete solidifies, then get it back. You would never buy a house that has all the scaffolding on it yet. You want something that's going to stand alone. So just as a, as a concept to think about what we do with learners is providing scaffolding to support them that we can remove as soon as we can, and this goes, Andrew, to, to the you know, gradual release is an example, by the way, of pulling back the scaffolding. We may need to be really specific in the beginning, but as soon as we can, we need to pull it back so that learners can stand, if you will, on their own, can, can own more of their learning, can be more determinative of where their learning is headed and the path that's going to take them. Oh, I, I'm so glad we get to catch up like this. Jim. I, I feel inspired <laughs> every time uh, I get fine. a chance to hear you speak about where we're at with things and uh, uh, whether that be in the current work or uh, in our vision for moving forward. Yeah, and sure. uh, I knew this was going to happen. Uh, time goes by really fast. And so we've certainly uh, <laughs> sure. exceeded our half hour, but I want to give you a little bit more space here as we close our conversation today mm -hmm. to just ask, is there anything else you'd like to impart that we haven't touched upon? Yep. The work is more important now than it's ever been. It's always been really important. Um, you know, if you go sort of from important to critical, I would say it's this work now is both urgent and important, but it's also the right time for it. One of the best times to make change is when it's already disrupted. And we are in the middle of that. And I think many of us look at this sort of traditional work that's been going on and now a changing context. I don't know if that's sustainable. I know this is. This sort of work, learner-centered work, is sustainable because learners can help us sustain it. And so for me, it's like, this is the time. We have an, a window of opportunity. And I, I suspect that if we don't take advantage of it, someone else will. And we'll end up living with their model instead of the model we create. Well, that is a powerful idea to end on. That, that speaks to me. It certainly resonates. It feels like that. I feel like and you just captured it really well. 
I'll just close by saying, Jim, it is always a pleasure. Thank you for taking the time to visit with us. And uh, I hope to have a conversation with you on a future episode sometime soon. Uh, pleasure is mine. And, and uh, we need to make sure that we, we don't wander down separate paths for such a long time. Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll make sure that we run this back sooner rather than later. So okay. thanks, Jim. Sounds great. Thanks. Thanks.